Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome everybody to the PIC. Uh, this is the eighth time that we've run this event, the Process Innovation Challenge. And it's a place where innovators get to show their ideas to an audience. In case you're not sure with all the virtual events going on, wh where you happen to be right now, you're actually attending the Process Innovation Challenge preliminary round number one. Now, where do you get service like that? Well, if you're here, it means you're interested in innovation. And we have a, a great show for you lined up. We have seven innovators who are going to talk to you about their innovation uh, in literally the blink of an eye. So they have three minutes. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, hopefully, you can all hear us well. Uh, Logistically, we are going to uh, explain a little bit how we're going to run the show to you. But before I do that, let me introduce uh, who we have on camera and who is involved. I'd like to introduce our advisory team. So the Dragons um, this year are Yuka Nakasone, Globalization Localization Director from Intento. Welcome, Yuka. Alessandra Benazi, Director of Localization at ASICS Digital. Welcome, Alexandra. And Marcus Meisel from SAP. And Marcus has quite a long title, which uh, I'm going to try and read. So, Manager of Translation Services, Language Experience, LX Lab at SAP SE. Welcome, Marcus. Uh, this is Dave Ruan here. I'm the Ma Manager for Digital Content Partnerships at XTM International. And I'm uh, joined by my co host, uh, Alex Burnett from Lockworld. Welcome, Alex. We're here again. Thank you. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. Well, what's this all about and how do we do it? Quick intro on logistics. Uh, we are going to then have a pitch from each of the seven innovators today. We'll have another session tomorrow with another seven. There will be an opportunity for questions from the dragons. We'll also take some questions from the floor so you can send your questions in through the tool. That's through the question tool. Uh, we will then run through each of the seven pitches and then wrap up so that's the plan now you might ask well what are the rules um well we'd like to call them guidelines rather than rules um three minutes is the pitch time so for each of the innovators they have three minutes in order to get their idea across uh, three slides is the norm so more or less each of them will have mm, three or three and a bit slides with which to show you their idea. They may, may also show some other elements, maybe some video and some visual elements as well. Why three cubed, you may ask? Well, three minutes, three slides, and we have three dragons. I used to like maths a lot. Uh, I'd like to, Alex, maybe point out a little bit what's up for grabs for the audience today. You bet. So we're thrilled to be able to give away uh, one free registration uh, for Loke Worldwide 42 that will be coming up July 28th through the 30th. And that is fully virtual Loke World conference. Uh, we will be giving drawing uh, one winner from the attendees that are registered and attend today's session and tomorrow's session. One total ticket will be given away. We'll be announcing that along with the uh, finalists for the final round of the uh, early next week. Thank you, Alex. Um, so let's have a look at our speakers. So today we have seven speakers, as mentioned. We start off with John Weisberger from Transifix. We then will speak to uh, Yukon Ren, Luke from Microfocus, uh, Takeyoshi Nakayama from Human Science is then going to talk to us about MT topics. Ian from TrueRab then comes on, followed by Sabine Peng from VMware, Martin Svenka from Memsource, and Adam Bittlemeyer from Modelfront. Uh, hopefully I didn't um, mess any names up too much there. Apologies if I did. Uh, there are innovators today. And uh, without further ado, uh, we will get things started. So welcome everyone. Good luck to the innovators. 
Good to see some new names and a few familiar folks on this list. Uh, let's small talk is done. Let's get down to business, shall we? Let the pick begin. So, John, it's over to you. Okay, do I have screen sharing yet? I don't see it. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, let's get into it. So, the, the problem is well known to everyone here, so I'll be brief. There are too many file formats uh, of various utilities. Uh, they handle entities in different ways, containing various types of metadata, useful and not. Uh, even standard file types that we're familiar with, people, our clients don't use them in a consistent standard way, and the CAT tool filters struggle with them. There's new file formats all the time. The same is true of integrations. There's new content management systems and repos coming online all the time with various requirements about files coming and going. It's a constant perennial problem. It creates a lot of friction, delays, and rework in the workflow. And it's just a consistent pain. Localizers tend to be outside of the bubble of developers and have a hard time affecting change in the tech stack of the developers to facilitate internationalization. Uh, even the best state-of-the-art agile continuous localization workflows like we see here at the bottom include uh, repos, expensive connectors, and resource files, all of which present uh, multiple points of possible failure in uh, internationalization. So what we've done is we decided to bypass all that and go native. What we've done is developed a, an SDK that is installed directly in the development platform. So we're going to go straight into where the strings live and where the developers do their work. And we are gonna take control of internationalization and put the responsibility for internationalization where it belongs with the localizers. All this happens in the SDK. The SDK gets installed inside the dev platform and converts every string format to ICU, which is a robust internationalization format and wide use today and very common. So on the TMS side, all they ever get from the strings is ICU. So the basic infrastructure, we, what we've done down here is we've added over-the-air translation delivery on top of that. So uh, we've developed a fileless API to move strings between the SDK and the TMS. So the SDK detects the strings in the development platform itself, sends those strings to the TMS. TMS translates those strings normally. And then the translations are stored in a content delivery service online and are delivered over the air back to the SDK uh, at runtime. So it's, um, there's literally no files to store and manage. There's no files happening, just strings in ICU format. Goodness gracious, that went fast. Okay, so the uh, key benefits here are for developers is they get to work the way that they like to work. It's hard to get them. They don't know much about internationalization. It's hard to get them to do much about internationalization. So we just let them do their thing. All they have to do is wrap strings in the code, similar to a get text style format which they are uh, accustomed to, and then they can forget about localization. Everything is automated after that. It's uh, frictionless, continuous localization, no target files to store and manage on the developer side. For localizers, they get one single format that is robust, supports linguistics, uh, does things that they like. Um, their updates and their corrections are deployed immediately over the air, no waiting for releases, and you get to work with rich metadata instead of guessing from files and paths and things like that. And that's pretty much it. I had a demo, which I'm not going to get to show you. <laughs> but you can sign up uh, for I, I One note I have to make is that all of this is open source. In order to uh, promote adoption, we've open sourced the SDK and will open source the CDS um, in order to uh, facilitate adoption. You can see those links here and sign up for updates. Thank you, and John. Yes, that's me. Yeah, Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Well done. Um, you'll have to do it with the virtual round of applause, but uh, <laughs> uh, now it's, I'm used to that. <laughs> well I'm well used done, to first out of the gate. good stuff. So, um, uh, questions now from uh, the dragons for you, John. If you have a, a webcam, feel free to turn it on, um, and we'll see oh, if we can. Uh, I forgot to do that part, didn't I? Hello. Yeah, there's John. Good stuff. So, dragons, questions. Uh, I have a question. This is Alessandra. Um, 
when I hear internationalization, I think of, you know, the well-known gremlins of concatenation, you know, uh, hard-coded strings, uh, placeholders, Unicode characters. Does this solution address any of those gremlins, or is it basically the continuous process that uh, that is being addressed here? It's both. It, it certainly facilitates frictionless continuous localization, but it does because we do the mapping ourselves in the SDK of the string formats and placeholders and variables and other things like that into a single consistent ICU format. We do address a lot of that. Um, the future innovations will be to help address things like concatenation because the, the strings are still composed the way they are in the code. Um, but the next, you know, horizon for us mm -hmm. is to be able to actually push string, source string changes back into the repo. Thank you, John. So I continue because I... Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Yuka. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, just a quick question. You said you, you open sourced it for further adoption. So, uh, what's in it for you? Well, uh, we are trans effects, we're a TMS. So we think um, it's the network effects of localization in general. I mean, just speaking for myself, I'm a solutions architect and have been in the TMS space for years now. And these conversations around file formats and Build in build or buy and integration and all this stuff is just a consistent nightmare. So we're trying to make life easier for ourselves and everyone else. But uh, you know the value we bring is in the TMS. Uh, but it's there's just you can't keep up with the number of systems that you need to integrate with. It's crazy. So we're encouraging uh, everybody to help us do that. Great. Thank you. And so you thank you. You're 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 saying that this is an open source part of your commercial tool, right? I mean, Transfix is, a, uh, of course, it's a, a commercial tool for translation Correct. and localization. And, and I, I, I saw something like something, some, something sim not similar, because I don't know how it works. I didn't see it, so I really can't judge. But I, I saw some somebody who is addressing internationalization with localization, like Lingoport Globalizer. It's a uh, shift lifting. It's it's going toward the left uh, right now, and VMware Singleton is doing something like this. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure because I didn't see the, the demo. Uh, what's the difference between your tool and these solutions? Um. I think it's the fact of going, what we're saying is we're calling this native, we're going native into the dev stack uh, where the developers live instead of, um, and just letting them do their thing. So there are a lot of similarities based on what I've seen of those two other apps. I don't know them in great detail, mm -hmm. but it's, it's truly the frictionless continuous localization, um, putting a lot more control based on what I've seen of some of the other apps is there's not as much control on the localization side uh, mm. in terms yeah. of um, fixing the internationalization and mm. um, you know pushing translations out. So I, I'm afraid I really can't speak to that in detail. Thank yeah, you, John. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Yuka. Well, well done, John. Uh, good, good start for us. Um, just to remind everybody, uh, we have. Uh, question tool within GoToWebinar, so you can actually ask questions. And uh, if we've time during the questions section, at the end of each pitch, uh, we'll uh, we'll relay those to the innovators. So thanks again, John. Uh, off John goes. And next up is going to be uh, Luke, Keegan, Ren. Uh, hopefully he is there. Hey, hey, Luke. Yes, I'm there. I'm here. And. Uh... May I share my desktop? Hello? Yeah, you should be able to do that now. We can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, can you see my desktop? The slides desktop. Yes, we can. Yeah, the slides are good. Up. Over to you, okay. Luke. Okay, I can start now. That's okay. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I'm Luke from Microfocus. Today, I will introduce our innovative tool, web page layout checker based on character 
color. As we know, layout issue is a big headache of localized web UI application. It costs the software company expensive query resources to find the layout issue on localized web page. For example, the left web page is in German. The last two characters of the marked German word is truncated. However, the common Q engineer does not know German. How can he detect this issue? Another example, the right web page is in Arabic. As we know, the Arabic test should be displayed from right to left, but the market test is displayed from left to right by mistake. However, the common Q engineer does not know Arabic. How can he detect this issue? As we know, the common solution is that QA engineer takes a screenshot for the localized web page, then send to native speaker to check layout issue. It takes a lot of effort and consume a lot of time and it cost is high. This is our solution. First, our broad add-on add unique colors to the first character, the last character, and the middle ones of every string. The unique color includes a unique foreground color and a unique background color. Then our desktop application takes a screenshot for the web page and detect the layout issues. For example, the bottom left image is the screenshot of the color, the German web page. Our desktop application can find the color of the first character of the string, but cannot find the color of the last one. So it can draw the conclusion that the string must be truncated. Another example, the bottom right image is the screenshot of the color, the Arabic web page. Our desktop application find that the color of the first character of the marked string shows at the most left side. So this string must be roundly displayed from left to right. Comparing to a common solution, our solution can save a lot of effort, time, and cost. And our patent application is failed. And this tool has been used in our daily work. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, Luke. That was uh, very interesting uh, and good on time. Perfect on time. Um, Thank you. So, uh, questions? Dragons, please. This is Marcus. Uh, what kind of web technologies or UI technologies do you support with your tool? Uh, support uh, any HTML-based uh, UI technology. As long as your web page is made by HTML, it works well. Actually, it is not absolutely too limited to HTML. Uh, in theory, such as uh, the Flex, uh, uh, it can work too, and the uh, SVG it can work too. As long as, uh, as long as it is based on the Doom tree, it can work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So just, Any just, more questions, Dragons? Yeah. Just, just a quick question to understand it uh, well. So this is done after you lay out it and to streamline the the QA process, you use this technique, right? Uh, well, would you please pardon? Uh, 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 this, this QA is done after you lay out. Uh, QA uh, should run my tool, then according to my reports, uh, they can uh, know where is the issue and uh, they can make the judgment. I will show uh, errors and the warnings and so on. If they are not certain, they can send to a, a native speaker too. Yeah, okay. but uh, in most of the cases, they can make a, a, a clear, con uh, they can make a clear conclusion. 
Okay, so it's automated process and it's... Uh, sorry, I cannot hear you. It, is it automated process? Yeah. You, don't, you don't need anybody developing that, but the tool is detecting automatically. Yes, automatically. Wow. They just need to click a button on all of my browser extension. They click, mm -hmm. it's a check, and the report generated. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good, great. Thank you. Very interesting, Luke. Uh, that brought me back uh, over 20 years to the software localization world and not having any of those uh, cool tools. So um, thank you for that. Uh, so moving from the world of um, software tools and internationalization with, with John, um, let's, let's now invite our next innovator on stage. Um, so Takeyoshi uh, from Human Science Company, we'll just invite you to join us. Um, uh, Luke, you can turn your camera off and I'll ask uh, Takeyoshi to turn his on if he has one and we'll give him privileges okay, thank now. You. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. And yep. I'm going to share my screen. Um, yeah. Good to see you. And um, um, we can see you. Screen. We can see your screen right now. You're good to go. Okay. Um, okay, good. So, empty engines are improving first. And the paragraph aware empty engine is now available but there are not many translation tools that utilize the paragraph aware engine. So we have developed mTransfer office for paragraph aware empty engines. In this example, there are two sentences in the paragraph. With a paragraph aware empty engine, the second sentence is translated using the information from the first sentence. You is translated as your company. In Japanese, this is very fluent translation. Maybe you can understand this. With sentence level empty engine, you is translated as anatawa, you as a person. This is very unnatural. We never use anatawa in this context. But a sentence-based translation tool uses the paragraph aware empty engine as a sentence-based engine. As in this example, you is translated as anatawa, as a person. It becomes unnatural. So you need a paragraph aware translation tool for paragraph aware empty engine. We have developed a translation tool that supports paragraph aware empty engines. It is called mTransfer Office. It allows for one click translation in Outlook, Word, Excel, and PowerPoint on Windows. Because it is Microsoft Office, everyone in your organization can use the paragraph aware empty engine in their daily translation task. It is simple to use. Just select the paragraph aware empty engine from the empty engine list. Then click translate document. And the translation is done using the paragraph aware empty engine correctly. You see that you is translated as your company. And this is very fluent. You need a paragraph aware translation tool for paragraph aware empty engine, such as mTransfer Office. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Takeyoshi san. Um, very good, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, uh, did we all learn a little bit of Japanese in the process? Uh, I'm not so sure. So <laughs> let, let, let's ask the dragons what they think and uh, see if they have questions. Hi, Takeo, she said, I have just a simple question. It looks like you're using, is it like a plugin or something that a user installs or 
Do they yeah, need yeah, to have exactly. like a full solution? Uh, it is just uh, plugged in into your office application. Okay. So you don't need to have like your whole TMS solution in order to have uh, this plug -in. No. So it is very easy to install. Uh, everybody in your organization can use it easily too. Thank you. This is Marcus. So at this point, you basically take what the MT engine delivers to you and you rely on good quality. Is that correct? Or is there something yeah, that you can do about quality aspects? Uh, actually, there are some features like terminology and like automatic uh, characters replacement for better translation. But basically, we rely on the quality on the empty engines. And like if Microsoft or Google or Amazon deliver paragraph aware engines, we can use them at the same time with DeepL and let the end user choose the best engine. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, thank um, you. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, no, okay. it's, uh, I, I didn't have any question. The same as uh, Alexandra, so please, thank you. Yeah, really interesting. Um, and I, I have a quick question for you. And like, where is this going from here? Um, those types of examples okay. you showed uh, was to do with the paragraph relationships. What's next? Uh, hello. Uh, network isn't good. Maybe I should. Dave, do you want to answer, ask that question one more time? I think you may be cut out for just a second there. Okay. Uh, where to from here was the question. Do we go from paragraphs yeah, to I another Yeah, I didn't hear you. Sorry. Stuff? Here. Seems to be a little difficulty on Takayoshi's end because I think everyone heard the question the second time. Um, it's all good. Okay, what we'll do is maybe we will um, just send a message to him on that uh, question later and maybe we move on. So Takeyoshi san thank you very much. And uh, let's move on to our next innovator. So Ian, you're up next. Uh, who, who said we're going to get away without technical issues? So Ian, I'll give you presenter privileges. And just to remind everyone before we pass to Ian, Ian, you can set yourself up there. Um, you think you need to unmute. Um, that you can ask questions through the tool. Uh, in fact, you can also chat through the tool. So if you think someone's uh, presentation was fantastic or interesting innovation, feel free to add a comment, um, keeping them civil, of course. So Ian, can you hear us now? Yep. We hear you too, and we can okay. see your slides. OK, great. Um, so all, right. All, right. all right, thanks. Um, today, I'll be showing you universal embedded localization using the True Web middleware platform. Um, what this means is that when a user accesses any web application using True Web, we can create a layer of functionality between the user and that application. And then within that layer, we can embed a localization service such as TransFX Live, um, which is what I'll be using for this demo. And then together, TrueWeb and Transfix actually create an abstracted localization layer between the user and any third-party web application. And this is really valuable because it gives businesses complete control over the localizations they want to apply. They can deliver them in any language for any web application without needing to modify the application itself. And to 
show you this in action. Uh, I signed up for just a, a demo trial of JobLogic, which is a service management application. And the reason I selected this is because they currently only support English. And um, I've launched the app within TrueWeb, and I've embedded TransFX on the page. As you can see, I have the language picker down here on the right, which is a natively part of JobLogic. If I select Greek, you'll see that now I'm in the Greek version of this application. And uh, in a production use case, you would just remove the language picker and you could simply load the app by default in, in Greek in this case. Um, but the reason this is such a powerful solution is because unlike a browser extension uh, like, like uh, Google Translate, for example, all the elements of the app are captured, um, whether it's within forms, menus, buttons, dynamic elements, we can capture all that using our middleware. And probably even most, more importantly, the experience of the user is seamless. As they navigate through the app and interact with the different elements, their experience is as if Greek were the original language of that application. So why is there a need for this? Um, businesses rely entirely today on the software provider for any language support. And these providers will only ever do provide language uh, provide languages when there's some economic interest for them to do so. And even then there's still a large gap because it can be an expensive investment. It's also very common for global businesses today to have a massive portfolio of web-based applications from a variety of vendors. And the reality is that in most cases, the language interests of the business don't line up with the interests of each of their software vendors. And this solution brings a lot of value because it changes all of that and gives businesses the ability to easily and quickly localize any third-party web application independent of the software itself. It gives businesses the ability to deliver more functionality faster and most importantly, harness localization to create value for their global workforce. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, nice job. Uh, Dragons, what questions do we have for Ian? Can I? Um, it's a, it's a very interesting because I I'm I'm working with a company which is a SaaS company, and the the uh, requirements from the partners and and users doesn't really doesn't match with the with with the so uh, with the um, disposition of the the SaaS company. So this is a very good solution. The only um, question I have is what is the business case? Who is paying the translation? Who is owning the translation? So in this case, I've um we're using True Web with Transfix Live, mm -hmm. and so Transfix Transfix is that um, I don't know what the like the technical term is, but the the translation provider. And so yeah. in our case, we actually have customers doing this today. And and so so they're customers of TrueWeb and customers mm -hmm. of Transifex. They use Transifex to manage and control all of their translations and localizations within the Transifex environment. We mm -hmm. simply act as the enabling element to embed that on any application. Yeah, but the, the application is from the from the client of true web right no it, you can put it, it anywhere i just i just yeah. signed up for just an application so you could have any number of applications from third-party vendors um, in place in your environment in your portfolio and you mm -hmm. can essentially translate them essentially it gives you control as if that application were your own because you're embedding transfix as if you actually had mm -hmm. the, the ability to, to embed it in the code so you can localize without having any permission from the the app company. Correct. Yeah. Wow. So where's the IP um, going? Uh, intellectual property. So it 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 functions. I gave an example of like a browser extension. So it functions the mm -hmm. same way. I mean, I can I can go to any web page on the internet and I can use my mm -hmm. browser and translate it to a different language. Ah, so it's for yourself. Yeah. yeah, so it's just for it's that company. It's, it's dynamic. Yeah, yeah. So if someone else went there, um, they wouldn't they wouldn't see those languages. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm simply doing it for my own business. So it's not for for 
to to sell but to use to to translate for yourself exactly right okay all right thank you great thank you dragons and uh, thank you ian um, just to remind everyone if you have questions you can just put them into the panel um, if you want to chat you want to comment on an innovation please do so as well um, thanks again ian from VMware. Okay. So Sabine, hopefully you can hear us. If you can turn on your camera and your mic, and we'll give you screen sharing. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Can you can see me now, right? My video is open now. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Over to you, okay. Sabine. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Sabine Pong, a localization program manager from VMware, and I'm working on delivering localization for our company's product. As LPM, we usually use LQA to monitor our translation partner's quality, and every time when I'm going to kick off a project, I'm wondering how is the translation quality of this partner recently, and how much of per how much percentage of LQA I should plan for this project, and do I spend on LQA efficiently? To solve the problem, our team build the dynamic LQA framework. The fundamental of this framework, including following three items, data portal, LQA guideline, and online LQA tool. We have a data portal, which includes all the localization-related data of our team, including the LQA data. We checked uh, the LQ data of one year and built our LQ guideline. The key factor of the LQ guideline is pass rate. Pass rate is also a key match, key index um, we, we are using to in the quarterly review with, with our translation partner and we leverage it here. Um, we have different LQ suggestions for different pass rate categories. In this Guideline, we also set button line, the minimum, the minimum number of LQA. This guideline is integrated into our workflow. When LPM creates a project on TMS, uh, the TMS will retrieve the LQA data and also LQA suggestion from data portal. And the LPM can follow the suggestion to the LQA or maybe make some small revision based on for some special projects like a new product or a new language. When LPM kicks off the project on TMS, the LQA decision will be transferred to our online LQA tool. Once translation is done, the online LQA tool will pick up sample words according to the LQA decision, generate LQA data, and also feed the data back to our data portal. This makes the workflow a complete circle. About the benefits, um, for this, L this, L this dynamic LQA framework collects real-time data so that LPM can make data-driven decisions on project level and re reduce the redundant LQA. It helps us spend cost smartly and efficiently on LQA. After the implementation of this, LQA uh, this dynamic LQA framework in our team for around two years, the LQA and Percentage reduces by around 5% without impact on the quality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabina. Uh, very interesting. Yeah. The topic of LQA and, and how to, to use it for decision making. Dragons, any questions? I have a question. Thank you, Sabina. Um, so, uh, you're using the LQA historic data here to, as a benchmark. Um, oftentimes, we use other types of uh, decision factors, let's say, to decide what to LQA or not, like the content type, you know, user visibility, yeah. word count, whatever. Are any of those factors also um, taken into account in this model and how? Like, how are they weighted compared to the historical LQA data? Uh, yes, because considering all the other factors, uh, we also give the LPM the flexibility on DMS 
because um, they can we don't integrate these other factors into this framework, but leave the flexibility to them in the TMS. Uh, the TMS will automatically um, retrieve the actual suggestion, but we also give them flexibility to make the revision based on their real project uh, status. For example, they have new products, or this is a uh, first time to localize this new product, or this first time to localize this language, they can uh, increase the, per the sampling percentage. Mm -hmm. So that this that those factors are outside of the TMS somewhere, right. and it's right. the project manager who makes those decisions. Then yes, because um, when during our discussion, we think these factors are not so easy to quantify, and we think it 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 also varies among products and the project stages. So we give this flexibility to add decisions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Sabina. I, I think we have a question in from the audience, Alex. Yes, uh, the, our question is, um, is this on, online LQA tool publicly available like some other um, LQA tools? Available on some other? Uh, this tool, I think it's not so difficult. The data portal are our own tool if it's if you if if any other LSPs or companies or buyers have a data portal they can I think they can make their own LQ guideline and make the have the API to be called to the TMS. So in in the fundamental this the data portal is our own tool and the is the buffer and to connect to each other. Great. Do you have a name for the tool? Uh, or... So, name to be decided, yes, it sounds like Savina. Um, we, it, and we, we, there was some uh, interference just at the end of your uh, questions there, but I think we got the idea of what you were saying that it's a tool that your company has maybe it's not publicly available but um i'm sure if someone's interested uh could they reach out to you to find out more information okay well we'll um contact with you later and if you want to for people to contact you, we'll make that available. Thank you very much, yes, Sabina. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, next up is uh, Martin from Memsource. So Martin, we'll get you going. Okay. Okay, Martin, we can see you, we can hear you, and hopefully you can uh, share your screen now. By the thank way, you. just thank you for the question there uh, from Yulia. Uh, keep your questions coming in, and um, Martin, I in perfectly. So over to you. All right. So I'll be talking about a business intelligence and connecting that with post editing. Okay. So would you pay the same amount of money for these two cars? We probably wouldn't, right? Every day we make our investment decisions based on the value that we are getting back. So how come that when it comes to post editing? We treat all documents the same way, no matter if you are dealing with a high value document that is getting lots of traffic or a low value document, you're always doing post editing. You're probably not getting a whole lot of ROI from the low value documents. So what you need to question really is the post editing step in there because that's where the money lies, right? Post editing is about 900 times more expensive per word than machine translation. The real question is, how do you separate the high value document from the low value document? There's many different ways to do that. You could do it based on business rules. For example, you know that legal documents needs to be always post-edited. But what I want to talk about is today is business intelligence driven decisions. So you can use business intelligence algorithm, collect metrics such as page analytics, user feedback, and decide based on that. Then your workflow is going to look like this. You're going to do raw MT only, low cost, and then you're going to publish immediately. And then you leave the document out there and you collect metrics. And then you have an algorithm 
that makes sense out of the metrics. And if it reaches a certain threshold, then it escalates the documents for post-editing. I'm going to show a demo. I have Zendesk article here, and I have Memsource instance down here. That Zendesk article has been already translated through raw MT, no human touch, uh, into Czech. Now I have Google Analytics that is collecting data about traffic to the document, about the user behavior around that. And down here, I have a little script by business intelligence script that is pulling data from Google Analytics and is deciding whether the document is worth post editing. So my demo is gonna be very simple. I don't have weeks here to collect the data uh, in this demonstration, so I'm gonna use real-time traffic. As soon as the document gets visited, that's gonna be good enough for me to treat the document as worth of post editing, and I'm gonna flag the document for post editing. So let's generate some traffic in this document, for this document. So this is the published version of the document now, and Google Analytics very soon should pick that up. There you go, it did. And down here, here's my algorithm now that is pulling from Google Analytics and said, okay, this, this document is interesting, we should post edit to that. So if I flip back to the Zendesk management environment and then refresh the document, you'll see that there's a flag. That flag means that the document is requiring post editing. My Memsource instance now is monitoring for that flag and when it sees the flag, it pulls the document in and sends it for the post editing step. So this is where it's gonna get interesting if I'm gonna get, if this is gonna be quick enough for me to finish. So within a few seconds, there should be a, a new project, there you go, created, and then the project will have the post editing step only in there. The translation is gonna finish very quickly and the post editing will be ready. That's that's it for me today. Thank you very much, Martin. And uh, well, well done. The demo seemed to uh, to go without a hitch. So uh, that's that. Uh, Dragons. Any questions <laughs> for Martin? I love it. It's great. Um, just a, a few, I guess, quick questions. Um, I, you know, you use Google Analytics. Uh, does it work with any BI platform that a company uses? And then quick follow-up uh, to that. Um, does an organization have control over the benchmark under which or over which the post-editing is triggered? And where does yes. that happen? If yes. In men uh, or where this work? <clears throat> So this, the, the, the Memsource part in this is the enabling for pulling the documents in based on the document being sort of a flag, right? The business intelligence algorithm, every organization is going to have a different algorithm, different criteria. We've been talking to, uh, we've talked to organizations that really literally use dozens of different criteria and then they use different platforms, let's say Adobe Analytics or and then um, so that implementation of that really uh, is sort of responsible of that organization. It would be completely custom. So you. sorry, so that yeah. happens in the BI platform. That that happens on top of the BI platform. You could use also non-BI tool. It could be more of a user user feedback, or it could be we've seen cases where it's collected for various uh, sources. It could be analytics. It could be user rating pulled from the content management systems directly. And then all mixed up together, and then and then uh, basically uh, generates through a formula some some sort of a rating, and based on the rating, uh, it's decided like what to do with the document. Cool, thank so you. So just to understand that the um, so the principle is actually the same as with you know other regular linguistic quality estimation tools, but you you factor in all these other BI things, um, these other criteria such as how often a page was visited, that sort of thing. Yes, yes, basically, exactly, yes. You could uh, you could even use the quality estimation. That would be more of a real-time implementation because the quality estimation can happen right after you've done the raw MT. This one is more, the demo that I showed is more of a, well, let's get a document out there to see if it proves, it proves itself that it's worth of post-editing. So you're sort of collecting the, the data uh, uh, directly from production and then, then that data will tell you but okay. you're, it's very similar to what you described. Thank you. Sure. Excellent, thank you, Martin. Um, and 
next up is Adam. So Adam, we'll just have you prepare and uh, we'll give you screen sharing. If you can turn on your camera and mic. Okay, Adam, we, I'm not sure we can hear you yet. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, we can hear you. Great. And you see my screen? Yeah, you're, you're good to go. Over Perfect. to you, Adam. All right. So I'll be talking about translation risk prediction. Um, it's also right in the research literature known as, as quality estimation, uh, what, what Martin has mentioned. So Modelfront instantly predicts if a translation is good or bad. That's all we do. Uh, the main use case of this is hybrid translation, right? Everybody wants to use raw machine translation for as many segments as safely possible. It could be based off of business logic, but of course the other point is that uh, the translation should be good. Here's an example. This is translated with Google Translate, some recent news, very uh, hot topic, uh, which the hot topics seem to be coming fast these days. All right, which one of these is good and which one is bad? Uh, so that's why we call it risk prediction. We don't actually know, right, is, is which Georgia is it? In fact, it is. this is the wrong Georgia. It's where this headline was about Georgia, the country. So if you look at machine translation, right, the distribution uh, is typically something like this. Most of them are good, and that's that's the pity, right? You you do want to use that machine translation. So you set a threshold. You say, okay, everything below this is good enough for us, and everything above this, we are going to have a human post edit it like we do today. So you you basically are saving 50% if the distribution is like this. Now, a lot of companies uh, have developed this. They've researched and developed it over years. The most well known in our space is on Babel and and Memsource. Uh, and so they've, uh, you know, OnBabel has made this a core of, of what they do for customer service. Um, we are doing something a little bit different. We have developed it, but we have opened it up to everybody. So we provide you our technology as a self-serve console and API, most critically, and even on-prem. And anybody can go to console.modelfront.com, sign up, get a million characters, see that it really works, uh, try some stuff out. So now, in addition to these kind of you know, elite tech organizations or top LSPs and top uh, CAD tools. Uh, we have new folks, including uh, one of the others uh, presenting here today, uh, Mark Mitak, who has created a uh, innovative CAD tool, open source, uh, which is also integrating Modelfront. And so you see that we are providing rather the technology so that others can uh, innovate their processes. So this is production strength. Uh, it's not a research project. It's, you know, a fully scalable API covering 100 plus languages, 10,000 language, uh, 10,000 plus language pairs. Security, of course, is a top priority as is a scale. So you can hammer us with millions of translations, locales, encodings, tags, and all that fun stuff. And of course, automated customization, because like with machine translation itself, customization is very important for, you know, the question of what is good and bad. So that's it for me. Thank you very much, Adam. Very interesting. Um, nicely uh, pitched as well, good and crisp. Um, so questions for Adam, Dragons. Okay, I'll start. Um, what do you do with the data that customers upload to the console? Like where is that data stored? Do you process it in any other way? Right. Yeah, so I mean, by default, if they're doing an eval, if they upload to the console, then we store it so that they can download it, right? Logically, we have to, and they can always request deletion. So we just store it. We never use anybody's data for anything else. And there's, you know, both uh, sort of privacy reasons for that. And then the other reason is just that we don't, people upload bad data to us to see, to clean it. So the data that we get anyway is not anything that would work or mix across domains and content types and use cases. So we we invest essentially in our own curated labeled data. We don't really trust anything coming from outside anyway. Thank you. So um, I, I continue. Uh, uh, you said that other companies uh, have uh, similar solution. So your innovation is uh, uh, applying this to the 
the public, I mean, to make it available for other people. This is what's your innovation. Exactly. So Memsource offers it as a, as a feature. Translate5 mm -hmm. is also now offering it uh, built into their platform. The, the mm -hmm. other ones that I mentioned, though, they don't really give it to anybody, right? So mm -hmm. Unbabel is obviously using it to be a much more automated and efficient LSP. Mm -hmm. And then um, eBay and Amazon and so on. I mean, Amazon does it for subtitles. They do it so that they don't have to they don't have to send the string to the LSP in the first place. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, you certainly put Georgia on our mind there. Uh, excuse the pun. Country music lovers. Well, Adam, you just nicely uh, I got wrapped it. us up in terms of the pitches. Thanks, John. Uh, and uh, we're pretty much done on our pitches. So what, what does that mean from here? Well, uh, you, you've seen seven pitches uh, from John, Luke, Takeyoshi, Ian, Sabina, Martin, and Adam. Uh, we the, the voting for this preliminary rounds is going to be done by the dragons. So the three dragons that you can see here. So it's Yuka, Alexander, and Marcus. Um, and a decision will be made on which of of these folks will go to the final, which will be held at the end of July at Lock World Wide event. Um, so that's basically where we go from here. So we, we'll certainly keep you all updated through our channels, uh, web and social media on that. But just before we wrap up properly, um, we do have a second preliminary round session, which is on tomorrow um, at 3 p.m. So change of hour, 3 p.m. Central European summertime. Uh, please do your own calculation on that. Uh, and uh, that will be two preliminary rounds. And someone's just asked the question, how many finalists will there be? Well, just to answer it uh, by telling you what we've done. Previously, we've had six finalists uh, in pre previous pick finals. Uh, and this year, the Dragons with the uh, rest of the advisory team, Alex and myself, will make a decision on, on what we do this year, whether it's, it's six finalists that will go through. So uh, just for everyone to be aware, that's what we've done until now. Okay. Good. Um, question. Uh, let me share with you a little something else. So yeah, here are the topics for tomorrow. So we're going to uh, kick off with... Uh, Andy, uh, Zidron, uh, then we're going to have Justine from IBM. Kirill from Content Quo is going to talk to us about MT again. Uh, I should have said what Justine is going to cover, shouldn't I? Uh, so it's going to be speech to text, subtitling, and then Andy is going to talk about AI extraction. Uh, Mark, who was mentioned at least already, uh, he, he's going to talk about WYSIWYG, anyone who remembers that acronym. Uh, you will want to see Mark's innovation tomorrow. Natalia is going to talk to us a little, little bit about uh, LPA, localization process automation. Uh, Reme is going to talk about instant translations, as you can see there. And Walter will wrap us up tomorrow. Uh, it's a little bit cryptic, it's watch instead of read. So you better turn up and watch his pitch to uh, get the details on that. Um, so that's where, where we go next. Uh, as Alex mentioned at the outset, um, anyone who's registered and turns up to either session, and you will need to register for tomorrow's session separately, please check our website, pick.lockworld.com for the link, uh, or any of our social media channels on LinkedIn or Twitter, and uh, you'll be able to register again. So please do if you want to join. Uh, and we will have one prize of a free pass to Lock Worldwide uh, at the end of July. Alex, right? So that's available to one person chosen at random from both sessions. Isn't that correct, Alex? Correct. And we'll contact you via email and we'll also just publish your name and your company name uh, to the PIC and the Loke World websites uh, to announce that you're the winner. I'd just like to take a second.
on behalf of uh, Ulrich Hennis and Donna uh, Parrish of Loke World, uh, thank our dragons, thank our contestants today. Uh, the quality of the process innovation challenge and the submissions gets better every year. And this is just uh, personally, I'm, I'm thrilled to be it and uh, want to thank Dave as well for organizing this and, and running a great contest. Excellent. Thank you, Alex. Um... Thanks to Dragons, thanks everyone who's turned up and uh, and innovators, thank you all very much. Um, we shall now part and uh, head off back to work, I guess, in some cases. So thank you very much. We're closing today's session. Thank you. Thanks everyone, we'll see you back tomorrow. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, bye.